Welcome to this episode of Eureka. The word universe immediately evokes in our mind twinkling stars, perhaps planets, and maybe if you are looking through a telescope, nebulae. But then universe is much, 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 much beyond this. Have you heard of something called pulsars? A stellar object which rotates around itself perhaps more than 100 times in a minute? or neutral hydrogen that is spread in the interstellar medium. If you want to know the universe which is not visible to us in the visible light, you have to use it other techniques. The giant meter wave radio telescope, GMRT, which is part of the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, a TIFR institution, is an effort in that direction. This unique facility is being operated from India in Maharashtra near Pune. The dean of this facility, GMRT NCRA, Professor Yashwan Gupta is our guest today. And thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, being with us. Before we continue this discussion, we'll take a quick look at his profile. Professor Yashwan Gupta has held various key positions in scientific fraternity. presently is the Dean of GMRT Observatory, a world-class instrument built and operated by the National Centre for Radio Astrophysics, TIFR in Pune. Having over 27 years of experience in active research and technical activities in radio astronomy, Professor Yashwan Gupta obtained his MS and PhD in radio astronomy from the University of California, San Diego in the year 1990. He has received various eminent awards for his outstanding work, noted among them SSB Award for the Physical Sciences in the year 2007. Thank you for being with us. Uh, let's start with this fundamental question. The moment one talks about telescope, one looks at a mirror, you know, I mean, or a lens. But then we are, we are talking about a radio telescope. What is it? How does it work? So, as we know uh, that optical radiation is just part of a very large electromagnetic spectrum and that we get waves at frequencies which are very different from optical. And so, radio waves are waves of one of those kinds of waves. And just like light waves, they follow the same properties. They are reflected by any reflecting surface and therefore you can build a radio telescope uh, much like a mirror. Uh, it has a similar shape except that it is made of metal which just reflects the waves and brings them to a focus. Something like this. Uh, like the dish that we see in the yeah, background. Yeah. And this allows you then to pick up the radio waves, convert them into an electrical signal, uh, which you can then amplify because these signals are very, very weak that we are looking for coming from uh, the universe. And then once you amplify the signal to a level where you can detect it, then you can actually look at the object from which these radio waves are coming and understand its properties by studying the nature of the radiation that they emit. And so that is another way, a complementary way of looking at the universe compared to what optical uh, astronomy allows us to do. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, one of your major work which is about pulsars. What's a pulsar? So pulsars are actually very unique objects in the universe. They are actually the dense core of what was originally a normal star, but much bigger than the sun. So if you have a star which is say 10 times heavier than the sun when it formed, then it goes through a life cycle which is very different from our sun. And it ends up in what we call a supernova explosion, where the core of the star collapses and the outer part of the star explodes, just like a firecracker would explode. And this condensed core of the star forms a neutron star. So it is made up primarily only of neutrons. So if okay. you imagine you take the atom ah. and you break it, remove the electrons, go to the nucleus and just pack nuclei together and make material out of it. Okay. That and is even what the neutron star the protons, is. protons, only keep the neutrons. Yes. Finally, the protons, electrons combine under the pressure and they form neutrons. Okay. It is a sea of neutrons and the density of that material is the density of the nuclear matter. Okay. It is 10 to the 15 grams per cc and you may ask, what does that mean? What it means is that one teaspoonful of that material will weigh 100 tons. I take just one teaspoonful and it will be 100 tons. 
My God. Okay. okay. And and then this is an object. It is about 10 to 15 kilometers in size. This core of the collapsed star, and it is made up of this dense matter. So it has as much material as our sun has, but it is smaller than a typical city uh, on Earth. So something like a object which is kind of you know maybe less than a Pune, but then having the mass of sun. Of the sun. That's kind of crushed inside. Crushed inside. So you can imagine very dense matter, very strong gravity force and rotating at very rapid speeds. So they are born spinning very fast and when you say fast, uh, how fast? It can spin uh, typically once in a second. The fastest ones we know go around once in 1.3 seconds. Okay. So that is 700 hertz, 700 times a second and that is much faster than the typical objects that we are used to. They are like the speeds of the motors that we use for various uh, activities. And so you can imagine now a mass as much as the sun, 15 kilometer size ball spinning at that rate. You would not be able to stand on it. You would be thrown out uh, fr from it on such an object. So these are very extreme uh, objects. You cannot create matter like that in any laboratory environment on the earth. So they give us a very unique um, uh, look into what happens to matter under such extreme conditions of density, gravity, temperature, magnetic field, very strong magnetic fields. You cannot create magnets of that strength in our labs. And you can then ask, do the laws of physics, how do they work under these conditions? Okay. Do the normal laws of physics still work as we know them? So uh, you mean to say that uh, when you use the radio telescope to study these extreme objects like pulsar, we are not just only finding out what is there in the universe, we are also understanding what happens to physics in extreme condition? Is that so? Yes, exactly right. In fact, this uh, took some time for astronomers to realize that when you find such exotic objects in the universe, then you can probe the laws of physics in a regime which is not possible to do in a terrestrial environment in our labs. Okay. And pulsars is a very good example of that because what people found is that the force of gravity near a pulsar is much, much stronger than what you can find around the sun simply because you can come much closer yeah. to the source than uh -huh. you can uh, come to the sun. Uh -huh. And under these situations, uh, you know, as you know, there was Newton's laws were the original uh -huh. and then Einstein came and modified them. And then people have asked, was Einstein 100% correct? Okay. Uh, are his laws valid in all conditions? And that is one of the biggest uh, challenges for, uh, for physics and to understand whether the uh, relativity theory of Einstein, uh, are there limits under which it breaks down? And there are people who have ideas about alternative theories and there has been a long standing debate about how can we test these? Is there a way to know? And these are objects and environments which allow you the opportunity to test some of these laws of physics simply because you can detect signals from such objects and they come in pulses. So uh, a, a pulsar works like a lighthouse. It has a fixed beam coming from the pole of the star okay. and as the uh, star rotates, you see flash. From one uh, pole to the other pole. pole just like okay. you see in a, uh, in a lighthouse. And by timing these flashes, you can un uh, understand the rate at which the star is rotating and any changes in that rate of rotation you can very accurately measure down to uh, one part in 10 to the 12 which are you know astonishing accuracy. Once you have that kind of accuracy then you can understand that if there is small perturbation in the neutron star's movement or orbit in a binary star then uh, it, whether it is due to uh, which law of physics, what may be the cause, you can study these in great detail and in fact one of the Nobel prizes in physics was given to people who studied one very particular interesting pulsar. For 20 years they studied the signal continuously and they could show that the rate at which the signal is changing is exactly matching with Einstein's theory. Very interesting. This is a very important point. Science does not work by faith. It's not just because Einstein said the laws are accepted by scientists. You keep on testing. You examine and find out whether it is correct. You look for evidence. We'll take a very short break and then we'll come back to this uh, program with more interesting questions and rich interesting facts. We will take a very short break, do not go away. Welcome back to this episode of Eureka and we are having a very interesting conversation with uh, Professor Eshwan Gupta who is the Dean of GMRT NCRA facility in India. Before the break we were talking about what is Pulsar and you were explaining to us what is Pulsar and how it is useful in understanding or uh, checking out whether the theory of relativity is correct or not. You have been working on pulses. What exactly has been your work? 
Right. So, as I was saying that pulsars are very interesting objects and we spend a lot of time trying to find more pulsars in our galaxy because you can then find more rich and interesting objects where you can uh, do various kinds of science. So, we at GMRT had conducted search looking for pulsars and then sometimes what you do is that you look in specific directions where you think more likely chance of finding a pulsar. Sometimes you look generally all over the sky to see wherever there are pulsars you may find them. So, we had found a couple of very interesting pulsars uh, in the early days of the GMRT. Uh, one was in a globular cluster. A globular cluster is a large condensation of stars. Uh, very rich in stars and old stars and old stars is where you are likely to find uh, pulsars. And we found one pulsar which was in a binary orbit. So, binary orbit means there are two stars. One was the pulsar, there was another companion star going around in an orbit, a bit like the earth goes around the sun, except yeah. that you know earth and sun are very different in mass, these are more comparable in mass, so it's like partners going around. And uh, It's like a do it. Yes, and they are very interesting objects because uh, you can study a lot of uh, interesting physics with that. The one we found was very interesting, so now when you know you can going around in an orbit, you can go around in a circular orbit slowly or you can go around in an elliptical orbit like comets go around the sun. They come very far, come very near and go around. So, we found this which was in an elliptical orbit which was ellipticity is 0 0.9. Now, you can ask what does 0 0.9 ellipticity mean? It means that the orbit is it's going like this. It is almost like a straight, straight line. Straight line, yeah. back and forth uh -huh. and it is very fast when it comes, like a comet goes around very fast near the sun and it slows down as it goes far away and then you can ask how can such an object form? What produces two stars going around doing this kind of a behavior? And the theory is that uh, in this dense environment where there are many, many stars very close to each other, there are exchanges happening between partners. Okay. So, you can pick up a partner, you can lose a partner when you come very close to another star because of gravitational forces and under such conditions, you can form an orbit which has such a highly eccentric thing. So, these studies help us to understand what happens in the globular cluster. We found this uh, pulsar in what we call a supernova remnant. So, supernova remnant is what is the nebula left behind when the supernova explosion occurs and right at the center we found this pulsar spinning quite fast. Young pulsars are born spinning fast and then they slow down over their lifetime. And what was interesting about some of these young pulsars is that they go through hiccups. So, it is rotating very uh, nicely, but suddenly there will be a small jerk. And uh, that is a very interesting phenomena. It is analogous to an earthquake. Okay. So, there uh -huh. is an adjustment in the crust of the star as it loses angular momentum and suddenly it will make a small adjustment and there is a, a jerk and you can actually measure these jerks. And these are very, very small jerks, but you, the accuracy of the measurement is so good that you can actually measure this and we found like it went through four or five such jerks in a period of four years, which was a very interesting study that we did and we published this showing that this is an interesting object which goes through this kind of a, uh, behavior. So, these are some of the interesting uh, discoveries of uh, pulsars that we have had and then we have also studied the emission properties of the pulsars. So, you can ask that this beam like a lighthouse, where does it come from? Does it come from the surface of the star? Does it come from the atmosphere of the star? Uh, does the magnetic field play a role? Uh, why is it generated near the poles of the star? So, these are very interesting questions about the origin of the radio emission that one can ask in order to try and understand these. And we have done a detailed study of where the emission may be coming from in the magnetosphere and we were able to show that it comes at a height of about a few hundred kilometers above the… Few hundred kilometers from above the pulsar. So, you, now you can imagine 10 kilometer size ball and it has an influence hundred, few hundred kilometers above it okay. to influence what is happening there and this lighthouse beam is produced over there. Over there. And we can infer all this by just doing these measurements very accurately and, uh, uh, and, and making the physical interpretation of these. So, this is very fascinating for us. The other area that uh, you have been working on is uh, studying the interstellar medium uh, by looking at the scintillation of uh, radio sources. Uh, what is it? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, like… Uh, so, the scintillation of radio sources is exactly analogous to the twinkling of stars. Twinkling of stars. When we okay. see stars with the naked eye, we see them twinkle yeah. and that is not because that the star itself is twinkling, it is because the light is passing through the earth's atmosphere and the disturbances or irregularities in the atmosphere cause the twinkling. It is something like for example, if there is a fire and I am on this side and I am seeing an object on the other side, when the fire is uh, kind of shivering, 
you can see that the object is also yes. kind of uh, another shaking. analog is if you look at the bottom of a swimming pool uh -huh. and when when the water in the swimming pool is disturbed yeah. then you will see disturbed images of objects at the yeah, bottom yeah. of the swimming pool so this uh, twinkling behavior uh -huh. Uh -huh. of pulsars we studied uh, where the twinkling is happening due to the passage of the signal through the interstellar medium in our galaxy okay. which is a very thin tenuous plasma uh -huh. uh, which then causes the pulsar signal to fluctuate it's basically thin and uh, less dense but but, uh, but because it's uh, very thick you know compared to from earth to pulsar that's because of it you are able so, to see so that so that's like exactly that. a very interesting question that uh, what is the distribution of this material okay. between us and different pulsars uh -huh. uh, is it continuously present throughout the line of sight or is it concentrated in certain clumps at uh -huh. certain locations this was the kind of questions that we were addressing from our research from studying the detailed properties of the fluctuations of many pulsars that we studied it's a very interesting thing let's take a very short break don't go away we'll continue this discussion and we'll talk about what gmrt has done in its uh, existence what we are going to head in future we'll take a very short break don't go away Welcome back to this episode of Ireka and we are having a very 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 interesting conversation with uh, Professor Yashwant Gupta who is the dean of GMRT NCRA facility What is so unique about GMRT So GMRT has a couple of unique features one is that it is a low frequency instrument and when i say low frequency you have to ask that the range of radio frequencies is very large from uh, wavelengths which are of the order of kilometers up to wavelengths which are of the order of millimeters and no single instrument can study the universe at all these frequencies so we concentrate on the low frequencies from meter wavelength to centimeter wavelength and in that frequency range it is the largest facility in the world today it's a largest facility in the world for that particular region and it has also a unique design it is Uh, designed with antennas which are 45 meters in size so this antenna that we see in the background is 15 meters so it is three times bigger three than times this bigger. Okay. and there are 30 such antennas which are spread out over a distance of almost 30 kilometers okay oh. and uh, then the signals from all of them are brought to a central location via optical fiber and our facility was one of the first to use optical fiber in radio astronomy to collect signals and bring them back and it is unique in the sense that users from all over the world use it for their research so about 50% of our users are astronomers from abroad and about 50% are astronomers from within the country and therefore it is a very popular facility typically we are oversubscribed by a factor of 2 to 3 and oversubscription means that the number of requests that we get for using the facility is 2 to 3 times more than the amount of time we have available Uh, in every six months or one year cycles for uh, doing those experiments so there has to be a selection of the various proposals that come in from uh, all over the world and there's a committee that is set up to review the proposals select the best ones and then give them time on the facility so it's very competitive very interesting i mean uh, popularly or uh, like uh, masses perhaps know about uh, let's say uh, space telescope hubble space telescope uh, which people think as uh, international facility uh, but here in india we have a facility which is used by uh, people from all over the world i mean because it's one of the unique in the world that's what you are uh, saying very interesting what would you say are the major findings that has come out of this gmrt so the gmrt has made many interesting and significant discoveries over the last 10 15 years ranging from studying you know um, looking for extrasolar planets around other stars like jupiter emits radio waves you can try to find planets around other stars using that uh, to pulsars which we already talked about and then to study radio galaxies so there are galaxies which emit very strongly in radio waves and have very special properties in the evolution of how galaxies formed how they evolved to studying the origins of the universe that when the universe first formed when it was neutral when it this first stars formed and it ionized the gas around it when did that happen can we study that gmrt has been used to make those kind of studies it has also been used to survey the entire sky at 150 megahertz and try to characterize what we see in the sky like a catalog 
like when we make a catalog or we make an atlas uh, showing the map of something the entire like birds of India, you know, yes. something of similar. Right, exactly. So it shows you in a in a map like an atlas where are the different sources in the universe uh, detected uh, by a survey like this, which is a very useful. Uh, resource material for others who want to study the universe. So there are many things that the GMRT has been used for and it continues to be So where do you see the popular. future? I mean our experience about more than 15 years in this GMRT, running it, operating it and functioning, what do you see the future? So the one of the things uh, that is happening uh, right now, which is no longer the future is now becoming the present, is that we are upgrading the GMRT to improve its capability by um, at least a factor of three, okay. make it much more sensitive than okay. what it has been so far. And the main aim is to increase the frequency range. Okay. So right now it works in some limited frequency ranges and we have now changed the entire electronics to give full frequency coverage from about 100 megahertz to 1500 megahertz, which allows the astronomers to study the universe in much more detail because you will now can observe at any frequency and look for signals over there. And also with a larger bandwidth, you can get more sensitivity and you can see fainter objects in the sky. So this upgrade that we are now doing is almost complete and by the end of 2017, we hope to release the full system to the user community. Already in limited phases, it is being released to the users and people have started using it even from this year onwards and new discoveries are already starting to happen with the upgraded system. So that is for us the immediate future. In the long term future, uh, we are now part of the Square Kilometer Array, which is an international project okay. to build the next generation radio astronomy facility on the globe. It's a global collaboration of 10 different countries right now, maybe more will join, to build something which will be at least 10 if not 30 times more powerful than what the GMRT is today. So the Square Kilometer Array, SKA in short, is a major technological challenge. Okay. To build something so large requires new technologies to be developed, to be tried out for the first time, as well as take the old technologies and take them to a new level. So in that sense, what the SKA project is doing is looking at all the large existing facilities and asking how have they solved particular technological problems okay. and how those learnings can be used in the design of the SKA. So in that context, the GMRT has been declared as a pathfinder of the SKA. Okay. And that means the work that we do, both in the technology as well as the kind of science that we do, is useful for people thinking about and designing the SKA. In fact, India is now formally a part of the SKA project, one of the 10 nations currently involved. And NCRA leads the Indian participation in the SKA. We are right now trying to organize the entire community within the country, all the astronomers and people with the technology know-how to come together and work as a SKA India consortium to make contributions to the SKA as well as to prepare our scientists to be able to use the SKA when it is ready for science, which may be around 2022 So, which essentially so. means that uh, at one point, I mean, at one hand, we are also trying to enhance the capacity of uh, GMRT. At the same time, we are also trying to be part of a very big international project, which is in the offing. Yes. So, we are taking both steps to ensure that uh, we will be at the forefront in yes, this research. Yes, exactly. We want to keep the leadership that the GMRT has established over the years by doing the upgrade and giving people an improved facility use for at least the next decade. Meanwhile, we are getting into the SKA along with the rest of the world so that at a later stage, the bigger facility when it is ready and available, uh, we will have our astronomers also able and ready to use that. Astronomy has been uh, fascinating. You know, any young person should be uh, would be fascinated with astronomy. But then people would like to take a telescope, look at the sky. But here you are doing astronomy where perhaps you are sitting before a computer screen where some numbers, you know, uh, glitter. Not so enchanting. How did you come to this particular field? What brought you here? So actually, I also started by looking at the sky through a telescope. Okay. And uh, I owe that to my father who introduced me to astronomy. Uh -huh and then to an excellent astronomy school that we had in, uh, astronomy club that we had in the school that I went to. 
uh, that really nurtured my interest in astronomy. I learned lots of the basic things uh, when I was in school. And then later, uh, I went on to do engineering, uh, electronics. And then as I was doing that, I was always interested in astronomy. So even in IIT, we had an astronomy club and I was active in that. And I was always thinking, what is the best that I can do to combine my knowledge of electronics and astronomy? And radio astronomy happens to be the natural uh, uh, field where you really use a lot of electronics, a lot of signal processing, a lot of computers uh, before you can make sense of the radio wave signals that, that come to our antennas. So in some sense, both of these things came together for me in the right manner and I was lucky to be able to go and do a PhD in a field which allowed the use of electronics in astronomy and that has helped me to uh, be part of a large technology project like GMRT where you need the technology, you need the electronics, you need to understand how it works in order to get the best performance from the facility and that has really helped me and has also allowed me to pursue my original interests. That, that's, that's a very interesting thing. In some sense, you are able to keep your passion as your uh, work. In some sense, you can say so. Uh, last question, uh, because we may not have so much of time. Uh, most of our viewers are very young people. People who are in their undergraduate courses and people who are trying to make up their uh, career. What would be your uh, message to this young India? My message would be to not close your mind to what you read and study, to have an open mind, investigate, look at other options. Today, there are large number of opportunities in India for doing science. And we need to be able to move from being known as uh, the IT masters to the science masters in the world. And we, you know, it's time for us to make that transition. And it is really the next generation who has to be able to step up and, uh, and take the challenge and move India to the forefront in, in, in science in, in the world. And I think we can do it. Uh, we just need our youth to think a little bit differently and uh, think, you know, let, 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 let their imagination and their passion take over rather than be confined with the standard things that we, uh, that we do when, you know, when we learn and... Follow your passion, look for new opportunities, open up new frontiers. This perhaps is a simple, sharp message from him to our young India. With this, unfortunately, we don't have much time, so we will uh, have to end the conversation here. Keep watching Eureka. Next week, we will have another conversation with another scientist. Keep watching Eureka.